Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce journalist Patrick Coburn. He has recently turned his attention to the role of Islamist rebels, and particularly Al-Qaeda-linked groups in the Syrian conflict, exploring the regional dimensions of Islamization. Tonight, we'll hear his reflections on the media coverage of the war in Syria. Um, the first question to be asked about the media coverage of the Syrian crisis is how far does it really matter to our general understanding of what is going on in Syria and the wider Middle East? It is often the complaint of those who specialize in a country or a topic that coverage is unacceptably shallow, simple-minded, and misleading. And one might rightly claim that the media almost universally accepted the accusation that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction in 2003. On the other hand, how far did this really matter, since one could argue that Iraqi WMD was the occasion rather than the cause of the invasion of Iraq, and if not WMD, some other excuse would have been found to justify it. But the, the main theme I want to put forward in this uh, talk is that the failure of the media, and indeed of Western governments, has been far worse in Syria over the last three years than anything which happened in Iraq Afghanistan or Libya. Uh, all these three wars were full of surprises, uh, suggesting that what the media had reported as happening had not been correct. Reco recall the triumphalism with which the defeat of the Taliban was trumpeted by television, um, radio and newspapers in 2001, and how they had bounced back by 2006. Something was obviously wrong with the original assumption that the Taliban was permanently out of business. But this should have been not, shouldn't have been quite so surprising. I remember following the Taliban as they retreated from Kabul to Kandahar as they were dispersing. Uh, and it was obvious that they had not been defeated, that they were in a position to come back. And much the same thing happened in Iraq when contrary rather to what was shown on television or reported in the newspapers in 2003, there wasn't actually much serious fighting given the size of the um, forces involved. Much closer to the present, the war in Libya was generally portrayed as a popular uprising against Muammar Gaddafi uh, that triumphed after six months uh, warfare. But in practice, the war was fought and won by NATO air power, without which the rebels would only have lasted a few weeks. I remember in the early summer of 2011, standing with rebels in their pickups, uh, with heavy machine guns in the back, a few hours south of Benghazi, um, and foreign uh, camera crews and stills photographers were embarrassed by the fact that there were actually more reporters uh, and media people present than there were Libyan fighters. They kept asking us to move out of the way, so the scene could be Libyanized. And it's an important point because, uh, to grasp because it explains why post-Gaddafi the opposition has had not had the strength to fill the vacuum left by his fall. And the country has fallen into anarchy. All these mistakes by the media uh, had important consequences. But to my mind the failure in Syria has been much worse. And it's not a failure of analysis, but of simple observation and reporting of well-authenticated facts. And even though I know the facts of the situation in Syria and Iraq fairly well, I still find it surprising uh, that people don't pay more attention to developments, crucial developments, over the last year or so. It's simply that if you take a map of the Middle East, you'll find that Al-Qaeda-type organizations with beliefs and methods of operating, similar to those who carried out the 9-11 attacks, have become a lethally powerful force from the Tigris to the Mediterranean. Since the start of 2014, they've held Fallujah, 40 miles west of Baghdad, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, ISIS, was even uh, parading it through its streets with uh, captured uh, US-supplied armored Humvees uh, last month. Uh, 
And uh, they did the same in uh, Abu Ghraib, where the notorious uh, prison has just been uh, evacuated by the government. Um, then if you, uh, if I turn around, I'll lose the, the map, but if you look from Western Iraq, uh, right up the Euphrates Valleys through Western Iraq, Eastern Syria, and right up to the Turkish border, is now held by ISIS or Jabhat al-Nusra, the latter being the official representative of what US officials call the core of al-Qaeda in Pakistan. Almost all of Sunni Iraq, about a quarter of the country, is now under complete or partial control of ISIS. In a city like uh, Mosul, with a population of over one million, the Iraqi army is nominally in control, but in practice, ISIS levies taxes on everybody from vegetable sellers in the market to mobile phone and uh, construction companies. By one estimate, their income from this one city alone is $8 million a month. And the, the same is true of uh, Tikrit, the hometown of Saddam. And uh, a friend of mine from uh, the city was telling me the other day that people don't, who don't want to, people don't want to go to restaurants there, un, there unless they are are sure the restaurant is up to date with their tax payments, essentially protection money paid to ISIS. Uh, because if they aren't up to date, they tend to get bombed rather uh, immediately. Um, they, they, the, the ISIS don't just hold Fallujah, they hold Fallujah Dam on the Euphrates so they can control the flow of water going south. Or they can flood it if they want or they reduce the flow of water to the immediate area below Fallujah and all the cities further down on the Euphrates, while over on the Tigris, and the Iraq completely depends on these two rivers, uh, the ISIS, the jihadis, blew up one of the oil, main oil pipelines at a place called Beji the other day. The, the, the oil is going into the Tigris. The Tigris is used for water for Baghdad after treatment. They can't use it anymore. So actually the two main rivers are actually controlled by jihadis at the moment. Shift the focus to Syria. The whole of eastern Syria, except those uh, bits held by the Kurds, are under jihadi control, whether it is ISIS or Jabhat al-Nusra, including many of the Syrian oil fields. One of the points I want to make in this talk is that it's, it's rather obvious, but I don't think it's generally realized, that the Syrian crisis has re-energized the Iraqi crisis. There isn't really a border between Iraq and Syria anymore. That obviously the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant uh, operates on both sides. They want to set up, a, set up a caliphate. They don't recognize that these two countries have any uh, legitimacy as nations or countries. Uh, and effectively, the border isn't there anymore in the areas they control. Um, and so yeah, if you go into eastern Syria, um, they, one form of jihadi or another controls the Euphrates Valley, ISIS controls eastern Aleppo province, where there's been a lot of fighting uh, recently. The fighting in the city against the government is led by Jabhat al-Nusra, which is Al-Qaeda in its Syrian uh, uh, shape. Um, the recent attacks on the Mediterranean coast in Latakia have been led, spearheaded, by actually by Moroccan jihadis, uh, along with Chechens. And if you go from north to south, uh, in the suburbs of Damascus, Jabhat al-Nusra is getting stronger. There's a big opposition enclave in eastern Ghouta, in the eastern part of uh, Damascus uh, city. Uh, you may have seen fighting in, along the Lebanese border, the Kalamun Mountains. <laughs> Again, that's uh, led by Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, but go this goes right up to the Turkish border. So actually, this is a vast area. Um, and the, well, while there's sort of fighting between the jihadi groups, actually, they have exactly the same uh, objectives and the same methods of operating. Um, and somehow, um, the rest of the world, I think, hasn't paid much attention, maybe because they think, still think of Iraq and Syria as being very sort of different places and don't 
associate and uh, one being connected with the other. But I, I, I'll kind of type groups now control an area, totally control an area there about the size of Great Britain, I mean, which is about the size of Michigan right, in the US. Uh, and they can operate over a far larger area um, right down uh, to, uh, from Basra right over to the Mediterranean coast. Um, I was looking last week at an ISIS uh, video of its jihadis burning their passports, with Syrian, Iraqi, Jordanian, even a Canadian. Uh, by, by the way, the Canadian jihadi says as he throws his passport into the flames, it's the message to Canada and all the American powers. We are coming and we will destroy you. It's a rather chilling video. Um, some people in the West, I think, have taken, and governments have taken comfort in the idea that there are jihadis who answer sort of directly to what used to be Osama bin Laden's organization, uh, and others who don't have any thoughts about attacking anybody outside their own country. But uh, th this is very optimistic, an old, old hat, I think. A friend of mine I was talking to a range of uh, Syrian jihadis just in the uh, in uh, South um, uh, East Turkey, was telling was saying that she found that with quote without exception they all expressed enthusiasm for the 9/11 attacks and hoped the same thing would happen in Europe as well as the U.S. Um, I hope I'm making the, the, the point that the, how important these developments are, and they've sort of happened quite recently really over the last year, and a lot of them over the last four months. Um, the other thing which I find extraordinary about this, that this spectacular resurgence of Al-Qaeda and its offshoots has happened despite the huge expansion of American and British intelligence services and their budgets after 9-11. Since then, the US, closely followed by Britain, has fought wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, adopted procedures normally associated with police states, such as imprisonment without trial, rendition, torture, domestic espionage. Governments have waged the war on terror, claiming that the rights of the individual citizens must be sacrificed to secure the safety of all. But despite these controversial security measures, the movements they're aimed at have not only not been defeated, but have grown stronger. I mean, at the time of 9-11, Al-Qaeda was a very small organization. But in 2014, Al-Qaeda-type groups are numerous and powerful. In other words, the war on terror, the wage of which has shaped the political landscape of so much of the world since 2001, has demonstrably failed. And it's done so primarily because it never targeted the jihadi movements as a whole. Jihadis in places like uh, Syria, uh, where their actions were advantageous to the US or the West, trying to overthrow Bashar al-Assad, were never quite identified as being identical to the core al-Qaeda until very late in the day. Saudi Arabia and Pakistan are the two countries that have fostered jihadism mm -hmm. as a creed and a movement, but there were important US allies whom we did not want to offend. Politicians are unlikely to dwell on this failure of the war on terror, motives varying from the self-interest of those in power to fear of being accused of unpatriotic behavior by those out of it. I suppose simple ignorance is also reason, and the fact they were under no pressure from the media. Uh, the la for the latter, for the media, the excuses for the poor coverage of the war are less good, but, but they do exist. Uh, an important one is simply lack of access. There was uh, decreasingly little interest in covering the Iraq war after 2008 and none after the last US troops had departed in 2011. I mean, people, somehow the Iraq war was treated as if it was something that had happened in ancient Rome or uh, under the Tudors in Britain. Uh, there was a tar decline, of course, there was a decline in the number and the resources of media organizations, particularly severe in the US after the financial crash in 2008 less correspondence on the ground everywhere. You've noticed that in Syria and Iraq, often though less experience. Um, you know, you used to have magazines like Time and Newsweek that used to uh, 
have large offices in these uh, Baghdad or Damascus or, you know, Beirut. Uh, only a few years ago that now don't exist or are a shadow of their former selves. I mean, British correspondents always used to try to get to hotels before the American networks had moved in and taken whole floors. Now you find an American network has got sort of one small room in one corner of the hotel. Um, in the case of Syria, there was also the fact from the beginning in 2011, it was much easier to cover the opposition than the government. Um, the latter was sparing and selective in granting visas, thereby creating a vacuum of uh, information which the opposition was very ready to fill. This is one lesson that the opposition had learned from the uprisings in Tunisia and uh, Egypt, Libya and Bahrain. They also, of course, the opposition at first had a very good story to tell. Because, I mean, whatever the Syrian uprising has become since, when it began in March 2011, it was a mass revolt against a cruel and corrupt police state. It was also a social revolt by people in the small towns and villages of the Syrian countryside who had once been the base support for the Ba'athist government, but whom it had long abandoned. But from beginning, the, 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 the media coverage was too black and white, demonizing the regime, glorifying the opposition. The impression, I think, also from the beginning was given that the Syrian revolt was as unstoppable as the one in Libya. Forgetting this has only been, the Libyan um, uprising had only been victorious because NATO airstrikes had uh, been crucial to rebel success. Uh, for, my, for the first time on television, there was this, uh, was almost a domination of videos uploaded to uh, YouTube onto the internet by the opposition. And uh, television had great appetite for this because for, was it showed the drama of war, of demonstrations being shot at, of shells going off. Um, and, you know, television always likes this. It's the sort of bang-bang of war. I mean, with Baghdad, the anti-aircraft fire spouting upwards and missiles going off. Um, but it was different in Syria, different from the wars in Iraq in 1990, I mean, the American uh, missile attack, 1990 and 2003, uh, because in Syria, the dramatic film was supplied by political activists from the opposition. And while television stations would say, we can't vouch for what you're seeing, but the fact that they put it on made, I think, viewers feel that they must think it was true. Um, and uh, of course, a lot of it was. Um, lots of events were recorded you know, that you previously wouldn't have seen. Um, atrocities could be proved, such as troops firing into crowds. Uh, but from the beginning, this sort of reliance on this sort of evidence from a biased third party could also be deeply misleading because you did not know what you're not being shown. I mean, I remember asking one rebel, you know, what was being edited out of these videos of various demonstrations going on. And he said, well, we, of course, we cut out the bit where the crowd, sh crowd shouts down with death to the Alawites. So that might give a, a wrong impression. <laughs> uh, and of course, there, there were worse sins than this. I mean, one correspondent in southeast Turkey came, this was earlier this year, came across a group of Syrian 10-year-old refugees I mean, in a camp who were watching a YouTube clip of two men being executed by chainsaws. Very nasty stuff. And the commentary said they were Sunni being killed by Alawites. But the correspondent, my person I knew, worked out that in fact the film was taken by a Mexican drug lord of two competing gang members who he was having executed um, in order to, to intimidate the opposition. Um, there, there are many other examples of this sort of the potential for manipulation of YouTube video when nobody quite knows where it's come from is, 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 is enormous. And initially, and to a degree to this day, uh, remains 
is you, you still see it being used in a, in a, in a very partial way. I mean, there's other th reason television companies like this, of course, it's free. You have to send your, your own uh, camera crew and uh, a correspondent out to some place. You're already looking at sort of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, so there's other major advantage here. Um, by the end of 2011, the media and political leaders in much of the world convinced that, uh, Gaddafi was, that Assad was going to go down like Gaddafi. Um, the Western press contributed to this belief because they were sympathetic to the opposition, and the opposition at this stage, stage was skilled at dealing with the media, and as the uprising became militarized, the media was often in the company of sympathetic, moderate, and non-sectarian opponents of the government. This produced an increasingly skewed view of what was happening and who was winning. At, at this stage, when political commentators in the West were speculating where Assad might go into exile, his forces still held all 14. There are 14 Syrian provincial capitals. Assad still held all 14 of them. So uh, I think this is partly a consequence of what had happened in Libya and partly the skewed media coverage, which I've just been speaking about. Last year, they did, Assad did lose one, uh, one provincial capital, Raqqa, which is now held by, uh, by jihadis, by ISIS. In reality, the foreign media coverage, which was often only reporting on the one part of the Syrian revolt they found uh, sympathetic. From beginning, there were at least five distinct conflicts taking place in and around Syria. There was, as I said, a popular uprising against dictatorship. There was also a sectarian battle of Sunnis against Alawites, which fed into the regional struggle between Shia and Sunni and which in turn was connected to the battle waged since 1979 between Iran and its allies on one side and the anti-Iranian faction led by Saudi Arabia, the US, and others. Also at another level, there was a resumption of the Cold War between Russia and the West. Um, good reporting had to take the complex relation between these different conflicts into account. There was a sort of romanticism also among the media at that time about the uh, what the revolt was all about, um, partly because one was often in the company of you know, the best people, I mean, ni nice people who wanted a non-sectarian Syria, um, a moderate Syria, uh, people who were prepared to sacrifice themselves. Um, but it, it, so I think for a lot of me media, it became evident, uh, it became, was, took a long time to become evident that the military opposition was increasingly dominated by the jihadis, particularly uh, as they were reinforced by those who had plenty of military experience from Iraq. They also had the enormous advantage of the, the Turkish border being open 510 miles along the north of Syria. They could move backwards and forwards, rather like the Taliban can move backwards and forwards into Pakistan. Um, if you go back and read the works of quite reputable correspondents of that period, um, it's quite interesting to see how many had a touching faith in some people like the Free Syrian Army, who were taken as being a uh, representative of the Syrian people, but sort of by the end of last year were completely evaporated, despite the enormous sums of money which they'd absorbed over the previous two years. Uh, there were other reasons why the media coverage was poor. Many of the foreign correspondents were based in Beirut and were un unable to visit Damascus because they could not get visas, or it was very dangerous. They would go th with the rebels, and it totally became clear that this was a quick way of getting kidnapped, which became, was sort of happening, but sort of by, I think, a few months ago, I think so there have been some releases. I think there were 16 foreign correspondents who'd been kidnapped and being held for ransom. But the, um, the reporting, therefore, was very much based in Lebanon, uh, which I think was rather like how in the 1950s and 1960s, Red China was reported from Hong Kong by correspondents based there, uh, and based there for years, but always were reporting, in a sense, uh, third hand. They never actually saw what they were reporting. Um, 
There's not a sort of unkinder analogy that one uh, correspondent in Damascus uh, put to me. He said that reporting Syria from Lebanon uh, relying on rebel sources was like reporting the last US presidential election from Canada using Tea Party Republicans as your main source of information. Um, I was always struck when I drove for a couple of hours to get to Damascus from Beirut how different the situation was in Syria compared to what it was imagined to be in Lebanon. At the end of 2012, when Assad was a lot uh, weaker than he is now, I was still able to drive 90 miles from Damascus to Homs without any guards and with heavy traffic on the road. But when I got back to Beirut, friends would sort of shake their heads when I told them this, shake their heads in disbelief, and uh, politely suggest that I'd been hoodwinked. What's the media coverage like now? There's less of it because of the mass kidnapping of foreign journalists by the jihadis or criminalized rebel gangs. There's a, a weariness with events in Syria and the rest of the world, perhaps, because it uh, looks as all the looks, all the news looks as if it's just more of the same stuff. I think the media uh, also uh, suffers from the same problem as uh, many foreign governments, um, non-Syrian governments, that in 2011, right into 2013, they convinced themselves that Assad was going to fall. Uh, and a Syrian um, official, senior Syrian official who hasn't is now left the government and lives abroad, but doesn't uh, didn't sort of defect. Um, was saying to me that they just he thought was the difficulty of arranging any type of peace was that foreign governments had sort of got so far up the tree, saying that Assad was going to fall, that uh, and this was inevitable, that they've never really been able to get down again, and actually have any form of negotiations. You may recall in uh, Geneva earlier in the year, John Kerry was saying um, the only thing will be discussed is transition, Assad going. But hold on a minute, Assad controls most of the population centers of Syria. I mean, this is not whether he's good or bad. And he controls most of the cities. So if you say that, uh, what you're in fact saying is that the war is going to go on. Um, compare how different the situation is, and I think this is a measure of how poor the media coverage was in, over the, the last three years today compared with what the media suggested two years ago. I mean, obviously Assad is still there, and it was imagined that he would go. Moderate secular Democrats were portrayed as the wave of the future, but most of these activists are dead or they've fled the country. Um, and as I said earlier, jihadi type groups now control basically all the, the opposition areas. There really isn't anybody else. I mean, could you, how could the war be ended well, actually, I don't think it could be ended in the present circumstances. Uh, just the level of violence is too high. I mean, it's what we, in Northern Ireland we used to call uh, the politics of the last atrocity being dominant. And the politics of the last atrocity are very much dominant in Syria at the moment. To my mind, the only way you're going to bring it to approach a peace, and there is a sort of stalemate on the ground uh, between Assad's forces and the opposition, although he's making some small advances. The only way you can really bring peace to Syria is to have ceasefires, probably unsatisfactory ceasefires, bring the level of violence down, and then you can begin to have serious ne negotiations about what happens next. Uh, but until that happens, it seems to me the war is getting very much like the Lebanese Civil War uh, of an earlier generation, which went ultimately went on for 15 years. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. 
Um, I'm going to ask just a couple of questions and then I'll open the floor. Um, you're actually telling a story that a lot of people didn't want to hear and still don't want to hear. And I'm curious about when you began focusing on the jihadi groups um, and whether, and the response you were getting then, and whether that's changed or not, because I'm guessing that you're, you've gotten quite a lot of criticism. Well, it's um, the jihadi groups in Syria. A lot of the opposition felt initially one is exaggerating uh, the extent of their influence. And a lot of the media also felt, uh, why are you giving such prominence to them? Because it's the very nature of the thing. The media, was, tr insofar as they went to Syria, was traveling around with much more moderate guys. We know this because if they tried to go with the jihadis, they would have immediately been kidnapped or shot. Uh, this didn't quite occur to people for quite a long time, that they were getting a very partial view from a certain section of the Syrian opposition. And it only became clear when the people they were with suddenly couldn't defend themselves. I mean, the, the correspondents who were with some local commander who they thought was in charge would stop at a jihadi checkpoint and the whole lot of them would be kidnapped. Um, and that was happening in end of 2012 and then got worse and worse during, uh, during last year um, and until correspondents eventually decided that it was, it was even the, the ones who were most uh, inured to this that um, the chances of kidnap were so high you just couldn't go on doing this. There's also, I mean, another thing which happens, sorry, the one, which is the Middle East conspiracy theory. Uh, we know that in some ways the jihadis, the president of Al Qaeda and others, opposing Bashar al Assad is good for Bashar al Assad because then it makes it more difficult for the West to intervene. Uh, they're frightened of these jihadis. Syrians are frightened of jihadis. If you're a Alawite or a Christian, you feel you've got your back to the wall. Then people make the jump of saying, since this is good for Assad, it must be that Assad started this, and he's behind all these guys. You know, but politics is about taking advantage of opportunities offered and mistakes made by other people, which is called what Assad does. Uh, so sure, they think that way, but the whole idea that the whole thing was a, a fake, amazingly prevalent in a lot of the Middle East, is untrue. You find the same thing in Iraq, actually, that you know, people say, oh, yeah, this, uh, the uh, Daesh, as it's called, the Islamic State, isn't as powerful as they look. It's because Maliki wants to frighten the Shia in order to get re-election in a couple of days' time. Well, sure, he takes advantage of this, but it doesn't mean that these guys aren't in control of about a quarter of the country. As someone who knows Syria and has worked in the region for a very long time, I wonder to what extent you think that this is an intensification of a battle of narratives that predates the war. I, I don't think I quite, how, how do you mean a battle of narratives in the sense of? Different, different points of view that all uh, reflect a kind of a partial truth. That's certainly what mm. I found doing field work in Syria. Yeah, I mean, the, a lot of these things were there before. It was always a divided place, more divided than they thought. I mean, you, and also there was sort of deep social discontent, which I touched on a bit. Um, you know, there was up to 2010, three, four years before 2010, there was this tremendous drought in northeastern Syria. Uh, the water rights had often been taken by local officials and dug lots of wells everywhere. Uh, so you had two or three million Syrian farmers who'd moved into shanty towns around the cities. These are often the, the areas that are the hardest opposition support. These also used to be the areas, these small sort of, uh, sort of one-horse towns in Syria used to be where the Ba'ath Party used to get a lot of its base support because they supplied jobs, control prices, they, uh, they sort of kept things, there were benefits for these people, but over the last 10 years under Bashar al-Assad, uh, 
economic liberalization, they'd sort of really forgotten about this. They'd become very much amalgamated with the urban, urban elite. Um, so certainly there are all these divisions just beneath the surface. But does that mean, you know, what is surprising, genuinely surprising, is this tremendous violence of the Syrian war, this sort of, why was it so bad? But I think partly foreign powers, you know, that the intervention of Saudi Arabia and Gatter, an awful lot of money around uh, to raise militias, weapons flooding into the country, um, uh, all these exacerbated these existing differences and these different conflicts which I mentioned all tended to sort of cross infect each other and make them make each of the worse. Thank you. I'll open the floor. Yes. Thank you, sir, for your talk. Uh, can you tell me if uh, Assad uh, is going to push the opposition back to the Turkish and Iraqi border and really take over Syria again? It seems that, like he's on a roll right now. He got rid of 92% of his chemical weapons, and no, but none of the jihadis interfered with the convoys that went to Lakatia, and also, the U.S. is doing really nothing. Uh, they just give him, now they're giving the opposition, I think the vetted opposition, they call it, um, anti-tank weapons. I think, I mean, Assad's forces are advancing. You can see it happening in Damascus and Homs to a degree. Um, but they're doing it pretty slowly. They're very obviously short of combat troops. Um, normally what happens, the opposition take over an area, I mean, sometimes maybe to the horror of the local inhabitants because they know what's gonna happen next, which is that the government seals off that area and uh, pounds it with artillery. Um, and they, um, then most of the population leave, some stay, who are the relatives of fighters, let's say, or people who are just too poor to leave, often. Um, and uh, then sometimes these areas surrender, or there's some agreement. But the, the progress is very slow. You don't, see, you don't see many troops on the road, and the guys who are doing the sealing off of these areas are often sort of um, draftees who are fat, out of condition, obviously aren't trying, planning to fight anybody too hard. Um, but it's one way of using troops that you're not quite sure of their loyalty uh, if you really put them in a situation where they might be killed. Overall, I think Assad, he can advance in these areas, but can he take all the rest of the Syria? I doubt it very much. Um, these... Uh, as he pushes towards the north, you move into hard Sunni areas that can be resupplied. They're fighting uh, jihadis who fight very hard. Um, there's a portion of the Syrian population who are not going to accept him, who will fight to the end. Um, so I think that it's unlikely that he'd be able just to uh, reconquer the whole country a question I don't know the answer to, which is very important, is does Assad think that? Does he think he can do it? And nobody seems quite sure about that. People who meet him say that actually Assad is sort of harder line than any of the people around him, that he's not looking for any negotiated settlement. Yes, the, the opposition to the Syrian government uh, back in the 70s came from the Syrian uh, Muslim Brotherhood. And is there still a Syrian Muslim Brotherhood and are they in any way involved in this equation? And secondly, you spoke about that there's no border now between Iraq and Syria, um, which is the unraveling of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And to what extent are uh, Iraqi uh, Sunnis and Shias fighting in uh, Syria. 
Um, Iraqi Shia fighting there. Uh, I was in Najaf recently in uh, um, the Shia holy city in Iraq and talking to someone that you, you have two types of Iraqis who go, the one who are very sort of committed, they go to defend Shia shrines in Iraq. You have other people who just need a job. Um, and uh, most Iraqis have some form of military experience, they sign up. But they're not the equivalent of Hezbollah from Lebanon, because Hezbollah has these sort of well-trained units who fought together, very experienced and very, very effective. The Iraqis are all from cannon fodder, who go to uh, go to uh, go to Syria. I mean, it could get. I mean, Maliki, the prime minister of Iraq, was saying the other day, you know, if all our troubles have come from Syria, then we're going to go to Syria to do something about that. Now, that may be pre-election rhetoric. Um, the the Muslim Brotherhood, yeah, in a sense, they're there. You know, that was always since Hama in '82 when. Um, 20,000 people or whatever it was were killed. Uh, yeah, there's always been these resentment and, um, yeah, I remember the beginning I was in a, uh, uh, you know, there's a hard Sunni area of Damascus called Duma and um, the, um, and I was talking to a lot of the activists there and it was obvious, you know, that this was 100% against the government but they were sort of showing houses that 20 years before the government had kicked in the door and taken the person away and that house was still empty and so forth. So these memories had not and the bit had disappeared and the bitterness hadn't disappeared either. So this was the brotherhood, uh, but also memories of what had happened in the, the last big uprising in the, in the early 80s. Um. Yeah, I think academics knew about uh, Sunni Shi differences, unlike people in the uh, Bush administration. But I think most academics are rather taken by surprise by the intensity of the conflict, sectarian conflict. Um, I know the narratives about Muharram and so on, but before the American invasion of Iraq, the intensity was never on the local grassroots level of neighbor killing neighbor. Could you say more why you think this uh, sudden emergence of uh, grassroots sectarianism? Yeah, I think sectarianism in Iraq was worse than people imagined. It had been growing under Saddam to a degree. It had been cultivated under Saddam. Um, it had always been there. There was the Shia uprising of 91 after the Kuwait war when, you know, tens of thousands of Shia were killed in mass graves and around the country, for which bodies later found. I think that Iraqis used to rather kid themselves on how non-sectarian it was, or they blamed it all on Saddam. This isn't just an Iraqi feature. I mean, I was um, in... Uh, spent part of my 20s in, in Belfast, and people would always say, oh, you know, Catholics and Protestants really get on. Okay, if it wasn't for this external force or the IRA or somebody or other. It just wasn't true. Uh, people would sort of kid themselves that this was true, and they always had a friend of the opposite sect who completely agreed with them. Um, but sectarianism uh, is often deeper than... Uh, people imagine. But then I think you're right, where I'd agree with you, is that after 2003, you have an additional uh, source of conflict, which is your foreign occupation. I think when people look at the uh, invasion of Iraq, two things are pushed together, don't really belong together. One was the invasion to overthrow Saddam, which most, by that time, most Iraqis, including Sunni, had been wanted to see the back of Saddam. And then there was the occupation of Iraq, which most Iraqis didn't want for different reasons. Um, and I think that exacerbated sectarianism. Because let's say you have Sunni and a Shia living opposite uh, each other. Um, and the Sunni feels, yeah, you're a Shia, you're different. But suddenly the Shia is allied to the Americans and, and maybe to the Iranians. So he is a friend of the foreign occupier as well. So for the reasons for killing him, escalate. 
when you have these existing domestic differences amalgamating with the hostility between the occupiers and the occupied. Does that go some way to responding to what you were asking? I, I find that the, the sectarianism is somewhat different. Like, for instance, the Shi uprising. Sure, Saddam Hussein uh, used a lot of violence against the Shi's there, but this was a military violence. It wasn't neighbor against neighbor, and it really it seems to be qualitatively different, uh, both now in Syria and Iraq after the American occupation. Yeah, it did. It, it did get worse, but it, it. I mean, even then, it was, it was escalating, and I think societies often underestimate, the, how deep these divisions go, and how easily, they can open up. Uh, you don't need many massacres for people on each side to begin to, eye their neighbours and, feel really nervous. There's a question about uh, Turkey. What do you think Turkey gets out of this whole thing? What is the position of the Turkish government? Sure, I think the Turks are asking that question because <laughs> Turkey seemed to have a terrific hand of cards at the beginning in 2011. They were friendly with all their neighbors. Uh, the economy was going great. Uh, they seem to be a sort of what a lot of countries where the Arab uprising was taking place, the Arab Spring so-called, you know, wanted to emulate Turkey. Um, but somehow they got it all wrong. Um, they overplayed their hand in Syria, having been big friends with Assad, they suddenly backed the opposition, thought the opposition would win, but didn't really control the opposition, although they gave them sort of access uh, to move in exactly what are the relations between the Turks and the jihadis? Well, nobody quite knows, you know. Um, uh, I don't think the Turkish government is behind the sarin gas attack in Damascus, but, um, but there's a sort of confusion in Turkish policy. Also, there's obviously a big division within the Turkish government that you have the police suddenly stopping a vehicle full of arms supplied by MIT, by the French, by the Turkish military intelligence. Um, so, big divisions on it. I think Erdogan, like a number, maybe like, of politicians who are immensely skilled in domestic politics, um, bring to foreign affairs an arrogance, but also an ignorance as to what goes on. And I think he was personally responsible for uh, the sort of the failure of Turkey to really be able to do anything in, uh, effective in Syria. Thanks very much. Um, I got the sense that uh, you believe the media is sort of overstating the divisions between ISIS and al-Nusra, or I, I think that's what you were saying. Um, and I was, uh, yeah, just al-Qaeda al affiliated rebels, basically. And um, I was wondering if you could maybe speak more about their, their relationship and how you see the role of ISIS playing out and their influence. Um, and then maybe d discuss how that relates to local ceasefires and how that would work, uh, negotiating with them and going forward. Um, I mean, the divisions, the sort of intra-jihadi civil war, which is really everybody against ISIS, was partly because ISIS, I mean, ISIS name, Islamic State, that they want to set up their own state. And they take that quite seriously of having provinces that, with somebody in charge of that province. And that doesn't leave room for any of the other opposition, including people who are ideologically similar to them. I mean, these are a very ferocious bunch of people. I mean, when you have al-Zawahiri, the, the head of al-Qaeda, condemning these guys for their extremism, <laughs> you can see 
you know, something is, I mean, they are uh, extraordinarily violent. But in the middle of a war, actually extraordinarily effective, too. I don't think they plan to negotiate with anybody. I mean, that's one of the problems of having a ceasefire. Um, it's also, when you have a very high level of militarization, then, and a war going on, that's the moment that organizations like our ISIS, which can sort of put troops into the field who are wholly fanatical and prepared to get killed, those are the circumstances in which they flourish. Also in which the communities are terrified that they're going to be attacked by, let's say, your Sunni community going to attack by a Shia militia. I remember a friend of mine in Damascus saying to me that in his age, he came from a working class Sunni area in uh, West Damascus, in, sorry, I'm in Baghdad, in West Baghdad, saying to me, uh, to me, we'd never let Al Qaeda back into our neighborhood unless we felt the Shia militias were coming to kill us and our families. And then we would. So I said, why is that? And he said, well, they fight like hell, you know. Um, so, you know, what's their future? Well, in Syria, they're pretty well dug in. It's difficult to see how the government's going to evict them. It's difficult to see how anybody else is going to evict them. Jabhat al-Nusra, which is sort of in around Damascus, sort of the western side of Syria, um, there isn't any sort of opposition to them within the, within the rebels. Um, uh, they're pretty sort of powerfully situated. Um, so I don't think, you know, can you negotiate these people? Well, actually not, you know. These guys are not in the negotiating business. I think that how do you put them out of business? Well, I think it's sort of demilitar you have to demilitarize the situation. You can't really do it while the war is going on. That's why I think the whole idea that you get from uh, the US government, from, uh, uh, from Kerry and so forth, that uh, support the opposition a bit, they get a bit stronger, then Assad will go and negotiate. Well, first of all, you'd have to have tremendous battles to switch Assad from being on the winning to losing. So that involves a lot more violence. But actually, if you want to get rid of Assad, again, you should demilitarize. Assad is not a popular guy in Syria, even on his own side. But there are lots of people who feel, well, better Assad than have uh, jihadis kicking my door in and massacring my family. Uh, and he sort of depends on that. So if you do, uh, to my mind, what should happen is the, the exact reverse of what Kerry and others were proposing at Geneva, uh, is that you need to demilitarize the situation. And that would both weaken the jihadis and also people who are currently behind Assad but don't much like him some begin to see other political options and other things they can do. But so long as the war goes on, then one of the reasons Assad has stayed, unlike Gaddafi, is the Syrian leadership hasn't split. There haven't been sort of major defections on the grounds of whole key units. Uh, and you notice in uh, Damascus, the people who are quite moderate are still targeted by the regime. And when I'm talking to, sometimes I talk to modern people, say, oh, they say, use my name. And I said, you just be really careful because the regime is, will target you, but in a way you're more of a threat than the guys with Kalashnikovs. Mm -hmm. uh, because they, uh, so long as the war goes on, that means the government <laughs> can keep crucial, the government and the army on its side. The war dies down a little bit then all these more moderate factions become more significant. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on two things. One is the effect of all this in Lebanon, and specifically with, I mean, you know, um, I guess the issue surrounding Hezbollah, why Hezbollah intervened in the, why, I mean, what was going on with the Hezbollah intervention a year ago, I think it was, and then also the role of Saudi Arabia with the True. opposition. It's a very general question. Sure, you know, it's a good question. I, I mean, very quickly, first of all, I think it was a tremendous mistake for the outside world to say, uh, you know, Assad will go down. This will be a tremendous blow to Iran, because they lose their main Arab ally. They blow Hezbollah, because they're cut off from Iran. But as soon as you say that, these are pretty tough guys, you know. They think, right, we're not going to wait around for that to happen. 
We're going to make sure that Assad doesn't go down. This is an existential threat to us. Exactly the same thing happened in Iraq in 2003, with people in Washington saying, aha, Baghdad today, Damascus, and Tehran tomorrow. I mean, what did they expect these guys in Tehran and Damascus to do about this? You know, they thought, right, we're going to prevent the Americans ever stabilizing their rule there. Uh, you know, then you can complain of foreign interference, but actually, if you threaten these people, they will, they will react. So this is one of the reasons that, you know, that Hezbollah is there, uh, because they think it's a genuine existential threat to the Shia. Um, the, uh, in Lebanon and um, throughout the rest of the Middle East. Obviously, it's destabilizing Lebanon. You know, you go through Hamra and uh, in Beirut, you know, you see uh, some poor Syrian beggar every 20 feet, you know. And it's, it, you know, it's awful. It's sort of people, um, you know, one and a half million people all over the place. You know, you see to, um, you know, I have to nerve myself to go through the border. Not because it's dangerous, but you just see these, you know, people in a real pitch of misery trying to get into Syria or get, usually get out of Syria into Lebanon. Um, Patrick, could you comment on the extent to which you think elements of the Saudi regime have taken fright at the Pandora's box they've let, um, they've let out with their support for Islamist movements? And what do you think about the state of relations between the US administration at present and the Saudis? Mm. I think the, the Saudis obviously are worried what they've done. Um, and they've criminalized uh, going to Saudis, going to Syria. Um, but it's probably a bit late in the day for that. Um, the, uh, um, they've, um, changed the head of their intelligence service. Um, then they have this idea that somehow you can produce a third force, which is going to be anti-Assad and is going to be anti-Jihadi. But it's this sort of, nobody can find this force. I mean, the, the idea was that it could be operate from Jordan and attack in the south. And then you have some sort of extra weapon supply. But actually, then the Jordanians said, hold on a minute, we would, you know, we're not going to let this happen. Um, relations between the US and Saudi Arabia, well, obviously, they are sort of frosty. But then the Saudis are behaving pretty peculiarly recently of deciding the most the Muslim Brotherhood are terrorists, which they aren't. I mean, this is kind of a middle-class uh, organization. I mean, it sympathizes in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, I don't think Saudi Arabia can actually move that far from the US. I mean, all, all this rhetoric you had at the end of last year, we're going to do our own thing. We won't take up our seat on the Security Council. Um, I think at the end of the day, there are limits to what the Saudis can do. Um, of course, what the Saudis have done, it's, you, the emphasis tends to be on money, donors from Saudi Arabia supporting the jihadis, uh, which was true and also true of the, of the Gulf. Emphasis also on volunteers, maybe 2,500. Uh, but actually, one of the most important things is all these hate preachers that you have on Saudi finance television and uh, the uh, social media. Uh, and the Saudi government doesn't seem really capable of closing those down. Where, where do you put responsibility for the failure of the United Nations efforts there, first with Kofi Annan and then, and then later? I think they tried quite hard, and actually for briefly it had an effect, because people hate each other so much there that actually anybody you can sort of mediate to a degree can actually have a, a quite sort of beneficial effect. <coughs> of course, they were denigrated from all sides by the Saudis, by the people in the, by the Gulf monarchs, and from the West. Of because at that stage they thought Assad is going to go down, and the uh, Kofi Annan plan and the UN is sort of simply sort of preventing this happening. Um, but actually, I think it was an opportunity lost. And I, I went with the observers quite a lot of times, and you could sense that actually there were lots of people in sort of anti-government areas who kind of needed somebody to mediate local ceasefires. And I think if you, if you do, if the situation is demilitarized a bit, <coughs> that's one thing that you should have again, which is sort of UN monitors. <coughs>
of some description. The problem is that Syria is so violent that, you know, if you called at the moment for the, the nations of the, the United Nations, to, do, does any state want to volunteer to send people to Syria? You know, they're all going to sit on their hands, I mean, very reasonably. Take ISIS, you know, which has all these foreign, foreign jihadi volunteers. It's still probably 70% Syrian in the Syrian areas. It may be, I mean, that you have the most sort of combat-ready units. You know, you have Moroccans or you have Chechens, and also you have suicide bombers. I mean, these are very effective. I mean, these Al-Qaeda-type organizations that suicide bombing and so forth turns untrained but fanatical people into a very effective military weapons. That's one of the reasons a lot of the opposition attacks have been effective, have been led by um, uh, suicide bombers. Well, I think, you know, after Libya, they felt they'd been uh, tricked that first, that the, by agreeing to NATO intervention to prevent the attack on Benghazi, they discovered that they'd okayed a, basically a whole air campaign which to get rid of Gaddafi, which ultimately succeeded. Uh, and I don't think Gaddafi would have gone uh, without that. So they felt tricked on that. So, you know, if they're going to be a, a great power, then I think uh, once they decided to support Assad, um, I don't think they felt that they could afford to lose again. And also, they probably, from a quite early stage, saw that the likelihood of Assad going down wasn't really that great, wasn't as, as much as people imagined in the West. Uh, so they were in quite a strong position uh, from an early stage. I think that, that that's the reason. Uh, my question is, um, how do you explain the switch of opinion towards Al Jazeera Al Arabiya uh, by the Middle Eastern regions and North African countries um, in comparison to uh, the positive opinion that they had before the start of the of, um, uh, Syrian uh, war? I mean, uh, previ previously, Al Jazeera was the most authentic source of information for those regions. However, nowadays, we're noticing a sort of hatred or resent of this um, channel. And my second question, if you don't mind, to, to how far or how long or why the media insist continuously in using the word jihadist as a synonym of terrorist? Why don't you name things uh, by their actual names? Because jihadist is, has a positive meaning in the dictionary, at least. However, terrorist is a terrorist. I guess I know why I use it, which is terrorist is such a misused word. Uh, and a word used to describe somebody you dislike. So suddenly, you know, who is down as a terrorist organization, you know, suddenly the Muslim Brotherhood in Saudi Arabia is terrorist, you know. Uh, terrorist organization in the United Arab Emirates, people are being jailed and so forth. So all these words are misused. Actually, I prefer jihadi to terrorist, but neither is that good. On Al Jazeera, you know, they became so politically engaged that I think people just became sort of fed up with them, you know, or when the side they were supporting lost, people turned against Al Jazeera, and particularly Al Jazeera Arabic. Um, and I think they're paying the price for that. I mean, they're also paying a price for actually good reporting in Egypt. You know, they have correspondents in jail. Uh, people don't necessarily like that. I mean, it's, it's, Al Jazeera, you know, produces some of the worst reporting of this, but they also produce some of the best reporting. Um, but they've made a lot of enemies along the line, and they're paying a price for that now. Thanks very much, Mr. Coburn. And I'd also like to thank Elwan for the Arts for sponsoring Mr. Coburn's visit to New York. And thank you all for coming.